Hey guys, it's Maggie and I am back today and I'm excited for this video because I have had it on my list to do for a long time now. It was just figuring out the time to do it, but I have time today. So we're gonna talk about extra intestinal manifestations of IBD. And I know that not everybody who watches this channel has inflammatory bowel disease or Crohn's disease like I do, but you may have some sort of chronic illness or a chronic condition that affects your life. And it's very likely that even if your illness is specified to one organ system within your body, it probably affects other parts of your body as well. So we are going to talk about that today. I probably won't be able to cover every possible extra intestinal manifestation of IBD, but I am going to talk a lot about the ones that I have experienced myself, and some of those have unfortunately led to surgery. If you enjoy my videos, I would love if you liked this video and subscribed. It helps YouTube push my videos out to a wider audience, so that is really neat, but yes, let's get into it. I'm really happy to hear more and more often that Crohn's disease or different forms of IBD are not just bathroom diseases or intestinal diseases. While the disease affects that the most often, that is the primary point of it, that's where the body decides, I don't like that intestine and I'm gonna attack it, it unfortunately affects many other systems in the body, and it can be because of medications or just complications of disease activity. And even if you don't have IBD, you might find some of these very familiar for whatever illness you are experiencing. I'm gonna talk about an array of complications and side effects and all the fun, <laughs> all the fun things that IBD can cause, uh, some of which I have experienced, some of which I have not. And the first one is arthritis. I am very thankful, very, very thankful that I have not experienced any arthritic symptoms, no joint pain, anything like that, at least not for long periods of time. I have a lot of friends that have Crohn's disease and they have arthritis along with it. And something I find kind of funny because I am a lot in the autoimmune space, so I, I don't just know people with Crohn's disease, IBD, um, I know people with other autoimmune illnesses and I have hung out with people with rheumatoid arthritis. And it's so funny because our, our habits and our patterns of doing things are very similar. I think it just has to do with both of them being autoimmune illnesses, but I find it so funny because we are both just as careful with diet and activity and things like that. So yes, arthritis does come along with Crohn's disease and I'm going to provide a website in the description below from CCF that is going to provide you a whole list of all the extra intestinal manifestations. But on there it says up to 30% of people with Crohn's disease also have arthritic symptoms. So. There you go, something to look out for. Another thing that IBD patients can experience is issues with their bones. So I have been checked many a time for things like osteoporosis, osteopenia, and all of the different bone issues that make them weaker and just not function as well. And that is because a lot of IBD patients are put on things like steroids. They also have nutritional deficiencies. That's pretty common. Things like vitamin D deficiencies, which I have definitely had in the past. But I would say it seems like at least among the people that I know personally that have had issues with their bone density and their bone quality is they had extended uses of steroids. Fortunately, I was not on a hardcore steroid very long. I think I was on prednisone when I was first diagnosed for maybe a couple of months, and then we switched over to budesonide, which is a little bit weaker. I actually got stuck on the budesonide, or Entacort, um, I believe is the brand name. I got stuck on that for a while. I wanna say that was at least six months, if not a year or longer. In the early details of Maggie, these Crohn's disease are a little fuzzy when it comes to steroid use, but I wasn't on it for long enough seemingly to affect my bone density. So I get something called a DEXA scan that looks at my bone health every, I think it's, I'm supposed to get it every five years, which I definitely have not gotten it every five years. It's an expensive test, um, but the last one I had was only maybe three years ago and 
everything looked good, but it is something to watch out for. Now the next one I have definitely experienced complications with, <laughs> and that is dealing with your skin and your hair health. Um, this is something I've shared a little bit about, but I am actually going to show a clip of how it has affected me, um, and I am actually starting to take action to hopefully, hopefully reverse it, and that is hair loss. So I previously was on a medication called Mercaptopurine, and it is a, it's a heck of a drug. And that was the original medication that I was put on for Crohn's disease to try and modulate my immune system so it didn't attack my intestines. One of the side effects of this medication can be hair loss, but thankfully, for whatever reason, I never experienced hair loss. Now, I've had friends and acquaintances that I know who have lost their hair from other IBD medications. I know somebody that wound up wearing a wig for a while because they were on Remicade and they lost their hair from Remicade. It's a rare side effect, but it, it happened to her and I know that it was devastating for her. So medications can be a cause of this. I'm very fortunate medications never did that. But I had kind of shared my experience this last fall with, you know, the dehydration and, and the iron issues, although I still don't know if I had iron issues or not. All I know is I was not absorbing a lot because my ostomy output was going crazy and my weight was showing it and I just didn't feel good. It did not take long for me to start losing hair. Um, I have had periods of slower hair growth. I have never had active hair loss like I did during that period. So I did take a video clip one morning because I was, I was a little freaked out and, you know, I was showing Zach and he was like, what the heck is going on with you? I brushed my hair and I got this big clump of hair and I was getting that every morning. So thankfully, it seems to have slowed down since my ostomy output has slowed. And you may notice I have very long hair. Uh, it grows fast, but it has gotten a lot thinner. And so I actually started some stuff right along here, because this is where I really notice it. Um, if I like pull my hair back and stuff, you can see some thinning. It's not bad. I'm very fortunate. It really is not bad, but it's enough for me to notice and it's enough for me to be bugged by it. So hair loss can definitely just go along <laughs> with the flares and the medications that IBD puts you into. So the other issue that people can have is skin issues. Now there are a number of skin issues that are common with IBD. There's things like pyoderma gangrenosum, which I have not had myself, but I've had a number of friends with it, unfortunately, and mainly because I'm friends with a lot of ostomy-related people. It is more commonly seen around stomas or ostomy sites, and I have seen people on social media have to get their ostomies revised to the other side of their bellies because the pyoderma gangrenosum is just so bad. There, I could make a whole video on it. Um, anytime I get like a little bump, around my stoma, I'm like, oh God, <laughs> please don't be that. It takes a lot of intensive treatment to get that to heal, a lot of wound care, and it's very painful. Another one is erythema nodosum. I apologize if I'm saying that wrong. Erythema nodosum. Okay, erythema nodosum. So I like to say things and spell things correctly because when people go to search for it, it's a lot harder if you're spelling it wrong or saying it wrong to somebody if you're asking about it. The one that really gets me is Crohn's disease. It is spelled wrong so commonly. It is C-R-O-H-N apostrophe S and it's because Dr. Crohn, I don't know much about him, but he's the one that I think discovered Crohn's disease. So it is Crohn's, his disease. So if you're spelling Crohn's wrong, now you know. Please spell right. <laughs> I'm just kidding, guys. But it really does help if you spell things correctly, say them correctly, because it's a lot easier to find out information about whatever you're curious about. Um, but yes, erythema nodosum. So it creates these really painful bumps on your legs. But I haven't known nearly as many people with that. Um, but it is something to look out for. So if you start seeing these red painful bumps on your shins, Make sure to mention that to your doctor. I'm hoping that when I talk about all of these, it helps you look out for symptoms, even if you're like, you know what, that has nothing to do with my GI system or whatever system is affected by whatever disease you have. 
look out for other symptoms because it very well could be something related to your diagnosed disease. Skin in general though, I know for myself personally with the medications that I'm on or when I've been in bad Crohn's disease flares, my skin just takes forever to heal and it just does not look as good. Um, you may have noticed if you, <laughs> if you wanna rewind or I can put it back up, in the clip where I show the clump of hair, look at my forehead. I was breaking out like crazy during that time too. I didn't know why. I am very lucky to have fairly clear skin, but I've always noticed that when I get fairly sick, Crohn's disease wise, I get bad forehead acne. So if you ever see me have forehead acne, know that I'm probably not doing well GI wise. Okay, the next one that I wanna talk about is probably the one that has affected me the most and I, I just didn't really realize how severe it could be and it's something that I ignored the symptoms of for far too long and wound up going septic because of it and eventually had to have surgery to correct it um, and I am about 95% certain that it is due to my Crohn's disease. I don't know why else I would have gotten this and I have been asked about this before because of my Crohn's disease, I have had kidney issues, which honestly is kind of scary to me because I already have one major organ system affected and my kidneys have always been great. I've never had issues with UTIs reoccurring or anything like that. Um, it just always has seemed to work well for me until a few years ago. It was probably, um, when I started noticing symptoms, it was actually before I had my colon and rectum removal surgery. That's when I went septic. I went septic in November of 2019 and had my colon and rectum removed in December of 2019. So it was only a month difference um, that I was septic and then got my colon out. And it was a whole thing. We had to consult with a kidney surgeon to make sure that I was okay to actually have, you know, this big surgery done. And it was, um, my colorectal surgeon did consult and made sure that I would be safe to do it. But it's still, I'm almost like, I probably could have waited on the colon and rectum surgery and had the kidney taken care of first because it would have made the next six to eight months a lot easier for me. I was in a lot of pain because of my kidney. I had developed something called hydronephrosis in my right kidney, and it was because my ureter on my right side, the tube that connects your kidney to your bladder, basically had a narrow spot. It was like an intestinal narrowing except my ureter. And I actually wound up going septic in November of 2019. I was hospitalized. You know, I had had kidney pain. I didn't recognize it as kidney pain. I had never had it before. And where my kidney was, where the pain was, was kind of right behind my stoma. So I had assumed maybe I'm getting blockages or maybe there's some Crohn's disease developing in that part of the intestine, I don't know. But it was so much more painful than the pain that I've had from Crohn's disease. And so when I went septic, I kind of had to push a little bit because, you know, they cleared up the infection in the hospital um, and they said, oh yeah, you have this narrow spot, but nobody kind of helped push me and say, hey, we should really look into this further. We should potentially do surgery. I was in a lot of pain and I was terrified that I went septic and you know, that can be deadly. So I wound up pushing to see a surgeon and getting the test done for it. And I was given a couple options of how I could handle it. I could live with a stent in there and you know, get it changed out and see if that would help open it up. The way it was explained to me is that that doesn't always work and it can close back up. And the other thing that they told me they could do was pyloplasty surgery, essentially just remove that narrowing and connect the healthy ureter piece to the kidney and call it a day. And so I chose to do that, which it was the most painful surgery I've had, I think, because I just didn't mentally prepare for it. I thought, how bad can this be? I've had so much intestine removed. I've literally had my anus removed. Like, this is gonna be, this is gonna be easy. No, it was the worst because when the surgeon got in there, he saw all of this scar tissue, decided to give me a two for one deal, scar tissue clean out included, and my whole abdomen was just, that was rough. That was a rough recovery. And 
Hoy. But it seemed like there were potentially two causes to this. It was either scar tissue buildup in my abdominal cavity that wrapped around the ureter and made it narrow, or it was inflammation growing. My understanding is that area of the ureter, they sent off to the lab and they said it was inflamed tissue, which just could be because it was narrow or it could be Crohn's disease. I, I don't know. But it seemed very likely that Crohn's was the culprit in some sense, either indirectly because I had had surgery, you know, multiple times and scar tissue builds up every time you have surgery or it caused the inflammation that narrowed my ureter. That is the scary thing because when you're diagnosed with something so big like Crohn's, you know, you're signing up for the intestinal issues and, and the bathroom issues and all that comes with it. And then you find out other systems of your body, like your kidneys and your bladder and things like that can also really be negatively impacted and can be very serious and can be deadly. And um, it's a lot to take in. It's made me very hyper aware of any symptom that I experience because, you know, I kind of go through this process in my brain. Is this a serious issue? Is this related to the Crohn's? Is this going to get worse rapidly and I need to deal with it immediately? Or is this just one of those fluke symptoms that I don't, you know, it happens and, and it'll go away. Or, you know, it's no big deal and I don't have to have any major intervention with it. That is the difficult thing. So I, I wanna share this video for a couple of reasons. You know, A, don't ignore your symptoms just because they aren't related to whatever system your, your illness is part of. And B, I want people to recognize that Crohn's disease is not just a bathroom illness. Obviously, I've had a lot of bathroom issues and a lot of complications that deal with my intestines and I've had intestine removed and all the fun things that Crohn's has to offer to us, but it has affected so many other parts of my life. There's so many other things that it has impacted and I just, I, I'm hoping to help build awareness. I think that that message is getting out there a lot more and I also feel like sometimes we go a little heavy on it and generalize Crohn's disease as a whole body disease, which it, it affects the whole body, but obviously the main target of Crohn's disease is the intestinal tract, the GI tract, but it can affect so many other things. Now there are a few more things that it affects that I've not mentioned yet. Did you know that it can affect your eyes? You can get inflammation in your eyes called uvitis. There's a few other complications. Um, I always like to joke that the healthiest thing on my body or the only thing healthy on my body is my eyes. Somebody knock on wood for me. I'm not sitting near any. I am very fortunate that I have fairly good eyesight. Um, I've always had pretty good eyesight and no real issues with my eyes. So let's, let's hope that it stays that way. Another issue that people can experience is liver issues like um, primary sclerosing cholangitis, something to keep in mind. Um, a lot of IBD medications can negatively impact the liver. I know when I was put on mercaptopurine early on, their big concern with monitoring me and the dosage was my liver. So I was getting at one point, I think it was twice weekly blood tests um, as they, you know, figured out my dosing. And I remember the dosing was really strange to the point that we got to. I was taking, I think, a whole pill one day. The next day I was taking a half pill. The next day a whole. And it was just altering like that. That's how I got to my <laughs> correct dose for my body. But I was going in for twice weekly blood tests um, to check my liver enzymes. And then I would space it out as we figured out the right dose. So it was, it was intense. Another thing that can be impacted is your blood. So things like anemia are very common in IBD. And there are a few reasons for that. That is absolutely something that I have experienced um, much more so early on in my disease, not so much now, but medications can affect this. The nutritional deficiencies that IBD patients can experience can impact this. Um, bleeding, we love to bleed. Our bowels can be really good at that. And that was part of my issue early on when I had um, pretty severe Crohn's disease and I wasn't really being treated well because mercaptopurine actually didn't work that well for me, but I was kept on it. That's a whole, that's a whole story as I've mentioned in the past, but um, I was 
basically having blood only bowel movements for a while. And it was, I mean, could have put it in a textbook for IBD. It was scary and shocking. And I remember my GI doctor telling me anytime that I had a bloody bowel movement to tell my dad. So I wound up having to call him into the bathroom multiple times a day for him to check it out, which was lovely. And, uh, and then he would obviously report back to the doctor because I was still young. So that, along with having so many colon issues and terminal ileum issues, I had a lot of stricturing, so I couldn't eat a whole lot. With all of these issues combined, along with the blood work that I would get for my liver enzymes, I would often get my blood counts checked. And for a very long time, I would regularly sit at about seven to eight for my hemoglobin, which is not good. <laughs> now it's around, I think, 11, 11.5, which is much better. But no matter what we tried, no matter the supplementation we tried or um, anything, anything that we tried short of blood transfusions, it just didn't work um, until I got sick enough where I wound up hospitalized and they figured out what was going on with me. And, you know, eventually that led to me living with an ostomy and just taking my colon completely out of the equation. Living with that low of a hemoglobin is just... I was exhausted all of the time. I was a very tired child, and a lot of my time was spent sleeping, which is just sad. It can absolutely impact your, your blood counts and, and give you some lovely anemia. So along with everything else you're experiencing with IBD, you're also lacking some good blood. <laughs> it, can, it can just ravage your whole body. Um, but I'm really hoping that this makes you pay attention to yourself. Don't ignore symptoms. I think there's this fine balance that I personally struggle with. Am I overreacting to something I'm experiencing? I know that everybody can have symptoms, you know, stupid little symptoms that mean nothing. You can get a rash and, and it just be a rash. Like maybe you wore something that was scratchy or maybe you have a headache and it's because you just didn't drink enough that day. But I'm on the other side of it, I'm like, ah, is this indicative of something more? I remember when I had been on Humira for a few months. It's a biologic medication. It's what I'm on now to manage my Crohn's disease. And it seems like a lot better of an option than Mercaptopurine, um, a lot safer too. But I started to develop rashes on my face and they were like little patches. Um, they were not necessarily on my cheeks, but I had some on my forehead, uh, I had some on my neck, and they went down to my arms. So I'm thinking, okay, I have rashes on my face. They're not on my cheeks. It's not a butterfly rash, but it looks similar to it. So I'm thinking, oh God, <laughs> is this like a lupus developing from the Humera use? Um, so I went to my doctor and I felt, I felt a little like crazy, but I asked him, listen, would you be willing to just check antibody levels, check my Humira level, make sure that everything looks good? But he tested me for lupus and it came back negative. I did not have lupus, thank goodness. But it is something that you have to watch out for with the biologics. So I'm glad that I, I said something to him. I went into his office, I showed him. I had also taken pictures of when they were at their worst. And you know, I, I showed him that. He didn't think I was crazy. I was just aware of potential issues. And I'm glad that I said something so we could rule it out and make sure that I was all good to continue on Humira. And now I've been on it off and on, but I've been on it for Oh gosh, we're probably at like, we gotta be nearing four years at some point, I think. I'm trying to remember when I actually, you know, first started and then I went off of it when I had my colectomy and my kidney stuff. I must have gone back on it maybe 2021. So yeah. Anyways, guys, let me know if you have a certain illness that, you know, supposedly affects one part of your body but it affects other areas. Tell us your story about that because I, I am very intrigued to see what other patients with maybe a different autoimmune illness or a different uh, chronic condition, how that illness has 
exceeded your expectations. Please share that in the comments below. Again, if you like this video, hit the thumbs up icon thingy, wherever, you know, I, I don't know where it is. It's somewhere along here. Uh, subscribe and thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate you watching this and I will see you very soon. Bye guys.